Amen. Well, hey, go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, We're going to turn our attention to God's Word now uh, this morning. And uh, uh, if we haven't had the chance of meeting, my name is Dave Jacobson. I'm one of the pastors here and uh, always a joy and honor to be able to look at God's Word together. Uh, As you're turning there, I kind of want to set the stage for us a little bit. Um, We uh, have been in this series for, uh, I think this is six weeks now, the sixth week of this. We're calling it Our Eyes Are On You. Um, It comes from 2 Chronicles where it says uh, uh, that we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And so collectively as a church, as a community, as a body right now, what we want to do is uh, in this season and time that we're in and uh, this continued sort of you know, ongoing uncertainty and uh, just honestly, sometimes it's, it's, it's just kind of grating and, and tiring and, and confusing and just all that we're living through right now, we are like intentionally, we want to put our eyes upon God. And we want to put our eyes upon Jesus Christ, and we want to look to the things that he's said to us, that he's revealed himself to us. And so that's what we've been doing in this series. And it all began under this premise of that we need a bigger God. Uh, So many times our vision and understanding of who God is is so much smaller than the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is not just a little bit smarter, a little bit bigger, a little bit wiser than you and I. He is so much more so. And his power is uh, beyond uh, oftentimes what we understand it to be. And his knowledge is so much greater than we would understand it to be. And so we want to get a fresh look and uh, uh, an honest look at who he is and the way that he has shown himself uh, to be. And so this morning, what we are looking at in God's word, we're going to be in a parable uh, in Matthew chapter 13. Um, So you can begin making your way there. Matthew 13. Uh, beginning in verse 44, and we're just going to do three verses this morning, 44 through 46. And uh, this this is what we're looking at this morning is a parable uh, that Jesus told. It's a short story. Uh, Jesus used this in his teaching throughout uh, as he, uh, in his life and as his his ministry, he would often use parables uh, for several reasons. But to boil all of it down, what a parable is, it's an earthly story with a heavenly point. And there is a major truth that he teaches through his parables, and this morning it is no different. And so the main parable is found there in verse 44, and there's a second parable that sort of supports, and it's it's kind of right there aligned with it. And the reason that we're turning here this morning, we're calling the, the sermon this morning, A God I Can Live For, A God I Can Live For. Uh, I shared with, uh, with those that were here in a part of our prayer and worship night on Tuesday night. I had the opportunity this week, um, the honor really to be able to do a funeral. And we have a pretty young church, so I don't get to do a lot of funerals. I'm not disappointed in that. Um, I'm not looking to like, you know, do more of them. Um, but uh, it was a family member of someone in our church um, who passed away last week, and they asked if I would be willing to come and do that. And um, to be honest, yeah, I just, I haven't done a lot of funerals. I've been to many funerals. I haven't led and officiated and kind of been at very many funerals. And for me, it was uh, just a really, um, I think, a healthy, helpful, um, good process last week as I was um, preparing for it praying over our time, thinking about it, even on my way out to the cemetery. Uh, It was a graveside um, ceremony. And even on my way out there, I I, I just, I think this is true of the world that we live in is we are so disconnected and removed from death so many times. I think one of the things that's been especially challenging for this season for us has been how much death has been put in front of our eyes right now. I mean, we talk about it, you can't turn on the news with hearing the updated numbers, right, of how many people have died, and some of you know some people who have died through this season. And we all, I'm sure, there's not one person in this room who can't think of at least one family member or one loved one or one friend who you've known that has died. But even, I mean, we are so removed from death so many times because even the food that we eat, right, we buy, I say this like all the time, like the, uh, the food that we eat, I mean, we buy chicken and it's saran wrapped and packaged and it's just, it, it's, it's like chicken. We, we forget that, that it comes from a, a living thing, you know, the meat that we buy, it once was alive. And so this whole understanding and kind of picture reality of death is so removed from us. But when you have the opportunity to be a part of a funeral, the good thing that comes out of it is it reminds us of the frailty and just how short life is, 
how temporary and fleeting our days here are. And one of the things that I, I just, I keep thinking about is what is going to be said of me when my days are over? That could be uh, soon, that hopefully is not. Um, I think my wife and kids would have something to say about that. They want there to be many more. I mean, hopefully there's another uh, 50 years in front of me. But you know what? When that day comes, what is it that will be said of me? Not just like for the purpose of what's said of me, but what are the things that are gonna, that matter? What are the things that, that I'm living for and that my life is composed of and that I value here that is being lived out? And will that be displayed? Will that be said? Will that be recognized? All of those things. See, one of the amazing things God in his grace allows us to think about and be reminded of is that when we face death, we are reminded of the value of the days that we have to live now. And how are we using them? And what is, the, what is it that, that we value? What is it that is important? And that is exactly what we're getting at this morning in this parable. This God that we've been talking about, this is a God that we can live for. And he shapes the days that we live and the purpose of why we live. Let's get into the parable and we're gonna uh, see what it is that God has for us here. Verse uh, 44 of chapter 13 in the book of Matthew. It says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let's look at this parable to begin with. As I said, this is a story that Jesus shared. It's a story of an earthly example. He's trying to teach an eternal heavenly point, and there is a major truth that he is driving here, but he uses this, this story of something that to us maybe sounds like something out of a bit of a movie, right? Like I've always like wanted to, wondered. I remember I, as a kid, you know, as, we're, as I'm digging up in my backyard, I always wondered if I was going to find something really cool, you know, that just got left there. And, and, some, and I never did, right? Like we, we, I don't think there's any of us that have really found and discovered some sort of buried treasure as much as we would like to. But this was a little more common in Jesus' day because uh, the primary reason, they didn't have banks like we have now. Okay, and so all of uh, our money we keep in banks. Uh, in fact, um, money has moved much beyond like any sort of tangible thing. It's it's all, so many times just numbers on a computer screen, right? Like how little do we even deal with cash or even uh, checks anymore? It's it's just has moved beyond this kind of physical thing. But that is not the case in Jesus's day. In Jesus's day, there would have been valuables, and there would have been um, there would have been gold. There would have been uh, you know, um, jewelry and other uh, things of value, other um, minerals or jewels or, or whatever it might be, the things that they kind of treasured and valued. And, and if you wanted to keep that safe, that didn't go into a bank that went in your backyard. You would find an inconspicuous place and you would dig a hole and you would bury it. And that is how you would keep it safe. Therefore, if you were ever robbed, someone came into your place, they wouldn't be able to find it. Oftentimes, if there was an attacking army that was coming upon a city or a town, people would go and they would bury uh, anything of value. And so that as the army came in, they wouldn't be able to find it. But imagine, I mean, that happens and you are killed in the battle. Uh, that treasure just kind of stays there in the ground. Nobody knows about it and it could change hands many, many times. So that's sort of the scenario of what Jesus is talking about here and he says, a kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. We don't know why, but it was hidden. And a man, he found it and covered it up. He finds buried treasure. Well, what does he do? Well, in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. See, he sacrificed everything that he had to be able to get this treasure of value. He didn't own the field. It wasn't his field. Uh, under Jewish law, this actually would have been his, okay? It's kind of like that, that uh, you know, when you were a kid, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? Like, this would have been his. He could have just kept it. He found it. But under Roman law, a little less specific with that, and so he wants to make no mistake. And so he goes, he sells everything he has, and he buys the field, and now he owns the field, and thus he owns this treasure. And it was in his joy, notice, in his joy he went, sold everything he had to buy that field. Why? Because it was worth it. It was worth it. For this man, this treasure he found was worth 
everything being sacrificed to get and to own this. Now there's a second story, second parable that Jesus tells right after it, and um, it's very similar to that. Before we look at that, how many of you are surprised to see that that only composes one verse in Scripture? If you know that story, maybe you've heard, I would say even outside of like the church, that kind of story has been told. It's only one verse. This is the only place. This is, this is where Jesus tells that. But yet, such a powerful punch this one verse holds. Well, the next story has two verses. Let's look at verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Uh, pearls were an interesting thing uh, before they sort of manufactured them to look pretty close to the real thing, right? Uh, when they were worn, it was basically like wearing your bank account on your neck. Like it was, it, it, this, it was just a way of sort of displaying uh, your uh, your monetary value. It just, you had that there and it was kind of there for everyone to see. And so they didn't have fake pearls like we have today. You know, you see someone in pearls and you just maybe, I don't know if you do this. I kind of assume most of the time that it's probably not real. I don't, I don't know. I'm just like, ah, who knows? You know, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Pearls aren't exactly um, being, I don't see any pearls here. Don't raise your hand if you do have pearls, but I'm not seeing a lot of pearls uh, floating around the room today. But this merchant was looking for a pearl a real pearl, a pearl of great value, the pearl of price. And upon finding one of great value, his response, similar to the man who found the treasure, he sold everything that he had and he bought that pearl. You know, for some of us, this idea of selling everything that we have would be easy to do. Uh, Some of you, A, maybe you don't have very much. Uh, Others of you, you don't have very very much attachment to the things that you have. Others of us uh, maybe are kind of in the other spectrum where you have a lot of things or the things that you have, you're pretty attached to. Uh, You can kind of put yourself in either of those categories. You can probably, if you're married, you put your spouse in one of those categories. And if you're, um, you know, stuck with your roommate here uh, doing online school at college, then you can put your roommate into one of those categories too. You know if like how valuable is our stuff uh, to us. For these men, it didn't matter. It didn't matter how valuable the stuff was. What they found was of even greater value, and so they sold it all to get it. And here's the thing for us is that we're pretty quick to put value and to assign worth to things. We have worth on the things that we own. We assign value to our relationships, the commitment, the things that we give our time to. And I would say for many of us, it's not always at all times a conscious decision of where we assign this value. But in these two parables, there is no question the treasure in the field, the pearl of great value, they were worth whatever sacrifice was needed to acquire them. And so here's the thing. There is one major truth that Jesus is teaching in these parables. Are you ready for it? You should write this thing down. This is the truth. This question is being asked, what holds the most value in your life? What holds the most value in your life? You see parables, they have one truth that can be applied in many, many different ways. There's all sorts of different applications that we can arrive at in this, but this is the truth that this parable is asking us, is what is it that we hold most valuable? This is the driving question that Jesus is asking you today. I wonder how you would answer that. What is it for you that is the most important thing in your life? What is it that you are willing to sacrifice anything for? What is it that you would fixate on or that you're concerned yourself with? What is it in your life that is of the greatest value to you? This is exactly what this parable is getting at. It asks this question, and there's two things Just two truths that I think we need to see and understand this morning from this parable in response to this question. Let me give you the first one. I would, again, encourage you to write this down. It's this, is that God's kingdom is of the greatest value. God's kingdom is of the greatest value. That is what this parable is trying to show and illustrate here. God's kingdom. It might be helpful for us to have an understanding or definition how Jesus is using God's kingdom here. God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, Uh, This is where Jesus reigns. In this series, we've been trying to put our eyes on God. 
And the kingdom of God is where his throne is and where he is seated upon his throne and where his will and his working and and all that he would have is being lived out and being displayed. And so he spoke, Jesus came all the time and he spoke often of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. So many of his parables were trying to illustrate and explain the kingdom of God. Why? Well, let me just summarize. Let's let's kind of back up even further. If we could just summarize the entire Bible into uh, just a few statements, we would say this, is that God created the world that you and I live in. He created this place and he made it perfect It was the place of his kingdom. He reigned, he ruled over it all. And he looked on it and he said it was very, very good. But when he made man and woman, he gave them the option, the choice of following and coming under his reign and rule, or he gave them the choice of not, and they chose not to. He told them not to. He said, what will happen if you do, everything will be broken, everything will be uh, destroyed, and yet they chose anyways. And so sin entered and broke and destroyed God's perfect kingdom. And so all the pages from like, that's like page three, all the pages leading up to the time of Jesus is God's working and preparing and getting ready to restore and to make new this kingdom which was shattered and broken by sin. You and I fall into this category as well. You and I were born into sin, and by our own choices, our own decisions, our own actions, we choose to rebel against God in many ways. We choose all the time to go against God's holy and perfect way and his holiness and his righteousness, and so this is broken. But when Jesus came, Jesus came to set set right what was made wrong. He came to establish his kingdom and his reign and his rule. And what that meant was is that he had to live in such a way that you and I haven't been able to. Nobody's been able to. He lived perfectly. He lived sinlessly. He lived in every way under the instruction and the, and the uh, expectation of his heavenly father. He upheld every part of the law. He never sinned. He never in any way fell short of God's glory. And yet when the time came, he was taken and and handed over to the Roman authorities and he was beaten and he was bruised and he was hung to a tree where he died. He was put on a cross, a cross much like what we have here. The reason that we have this, I don't know, we don't talk about this cross behind me every single week. I mean, this is prominently displayed in our church as part of our worship because this is the place where Jesus accomplished that which he came to do. And so if you want to look at the focal point, sort of the centerpiece of all of Scripture, it is the cross. It was the sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ, hung on the tree and his blood being shed, his life being given up, him pouring out his perfect life, taking on the wrath of God on himself for you and me. He came to establish his kingdom And then what he said in his time with us, his days here on earth, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. It is the place where Jesus reigns. It's the place where his kingdom is established. And he says he's coming back and he's gonna take those who receive him as Lord and Savior to a new heaven and to a new earth. He's gonna make this all over and new again and his kingdom will be fully realized and fully seen in all of its glory. And see, what Jesus is speaking of here when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. He's saying, hey, where Jesus reigns, it is a treasure. Why? Why is the kingdom of heaven like a treasure? Well, it is God's kingdom and it's his world and it's where he is reigning. You see, one of the problems, the major problem, the the biggest problem we face in our world today, and I would say especially here right now in our country is that we want God's kingdom, but we have rejected him as the king. We want all the blessings and all the benefits and everything that he would have as his kingdom, but we don't want him on the throne. We want ourselves, we want somebody else, we want whatever you want, put that on the throne. And what Jesus is doing is he's calling that to account and he's saying, look, this parable is saying, this kingdom of heaven is of the greatest value. My kingdom is of the greatest value. 
And the reason that it is such a treasure is because this is where God is revealing himself and his power is at work in your life. And let me just say this morning, this is a message that needs to be heard by those of you who are Christians and those who would say that you're not a Christian this morning, Christians and non-Christians alike. Let me speak, if I can, specifically and directly to those of you who would say you're a Christian. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this may be an, a, an important, but a simple but important point that you are overlooking in your life right now. That the kingdom of God is of the greatest value. How do we get there? How do we overlook this? Well, I think for those of you who maybe grew up in church or were part of a Christian family, uh, those of you who came to know Jesus at a young age, there may have been some value or appreciation that has been lost over time. As I've spent time as a pastor now for uh, quite a while and interacting with people, the people that I interact with, those that are following Jesus, that, that have the greatest appreciation for him and what he's done, not always, but oftentimes are those that have come to know him later in life. Why? Well, because they know the contrast of living without him. They know what a joy and what a blessing Jesus Christ is when he's reigning and ruling in your life. They know the drastic change and the hope that comes from Jesus being on the throne. And if you're in the place where you came to know Jesus Christ early and you began to follow him early, that doesn't mean that you can't appreciate it. It just means that maybe we need to be reminded of it a little more often. The kingdom of God is of greatest value. It's like anything that you sort of, it's been there for a while and so it becomes commonplace. It's like uh, running water or electricity. Uh, those are things that are pretty common to us, I would say, uh, all if not most of us, or most if not all of us today, right? Unless you go camping. If you've ever been camping for any length of time, and I'm talking like real camping, okay? Not like the RV uh, kind of, you know, hook in, plug in, you've got everything, it's just on wheels kind of camping. That's like, that's cool. I'm not, I'm not knocking that at all. I would, I, I gladly would do that. That's a fun way to spend a weekend. I know some of you love your RV camping, but that's not like camping, camping, okay? So I'm talking about camping, camping. I'm talking about the kind of camping that my wife hates to do. Okay, it is her idea of a terrible or a great way uh, to ruin a vacation is by going camping. Okay, and so if you've ever been camping for any length of time where you have no access to running water, no access to uh, electricity, no access to uh, a toilet, um, at least one you know like that we kind of typically use, then then you recognize like very quickly how nice those things really are. You're like, man, I, I, I take that for granted just how nice it is to go and turn on uh, the water and to be able to wash my hands, to be able to take a shower, to be able to get a drink, uh, how nice it is to have heat, to have uh, air conditioning, especially if you've ever been camping in uh, the summer when it's really hot and really humid, and then you get home and you're like, man, why do I do this, right? Like, why would I leave this? Because you recognize just how simple some of these things are. Are. You see, I think for some of us, we, we have come so commonplace to understand the kingdom of God and his reign and his rule that we have forgotten that it is of the greatest value. The God that we worship, the God that we serve, the God that we are here to glorify today, he is of greatest value. And as believers, we need to be reminded of that. Uh, to those of you that are with us this morning, whether you're here or you're online, and maybe you've just found us, uh, someone sent you a link, someone invited you through a text message, there are some that are here that I'm sure are in this place where you're not sure about Jesus. Uh, you're still learning, you're still trying to decide, you're still trying to think what you think about Jesus, what it means to follow him. What I would say to you is that this story is beckoning you, it is calling you to understand that everything that you're searching for in life, you can search for the whole rest of your life, but you will never be able to find that true joy, that true satisfaction, that true fulfillment, that true value that you are searching for apart from Jesus Christ. That is the only place. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
John 11, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The access that we have been given to the kingdom of God that place where he is reigning, where he is ruling, where his satisfaction, joy, all of that is seen and experienced is through the person of Jesus Christ and it is of the greatest value. I'm just telling you, you can search for the rest of your life and if you do not find Jesus Christ, then you have not found the treasure that he is speaking of here. He says, the kingdom of heaven, like a treasure hidden in a field, a man found, he covered it up in his joy. He goes, sells all that he has, and he buys that field. The deepest longing, the deepest searching in your soul is satisfied by knowing the God of the universe who created you, who cares deeply for you, and who sent his son to die for you. That through his resurrection through his life that he would redeem you and make you new and restore that relationship with you. He's your heavenly father and he desires that. Well, this is the first thing that we see in that is that the kingdom of God is of great value. The second is this, write this down, the way that you live your life reveals how much you value it. The way you live your life reveals how much you value it. So the kingdom of God is of great value, the greatest value. The way you live your life reveals how much you value it. Now let's make no mistake. The kingdom of God is of great value. The way you live reveals how much you value it. It has no bearing on the value of the kingdom of God, but rather what you think about it. Let's look back at the story. When this man, he found the treasure, says he covered it, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. Why? To buy the field, to acquire that treasure. Same for the merchant, right? He found this fine pearl. Upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. He got it. Now, there are many things that you could kind of take this parable and maybe try and take it to. I promise you that is not what Jesus is doing here. What Jesus is not saying, let's just kind of deal with this, lest you kind of go there. Jesus is not saying that you can buy the kingdom of God. You can't like purchase your way into heaven. Even if you were to sell everything that you had and to live some um, you know, sort of uh, life apart from any physical uh, well-being or any sort of physical uh, blessing or something like that, like you, that's not going to earn you the kingdom of God. Rather, the point of what he's saying is, is that it was the sacrifice that these men were willing to do that showed their value of the treasure of the pearl. It was worth sacking, sacrificing everything else to have it. I, a friend of mine once preached through this passage, and I can't come to this passage and not think about this illustration that he used there. And so I'm just going to uh, use him because uh, he was a very big uh, fan of pawn shops. Anybody else? Show of hands. Like, are you, anyone like, like pawn shops? You can admit it. You can acknowledge it. Yeah. So he was like all about a pawn shop. I'm just going to be honest. I've never even been inside of a pawn shop. Um, and so if I'm missing out and you want to take me, I'd love to just sort of like, you can show me the ropes and kind of show me uh, what, what's good there, what you can find there. But this guy, he loved pawn shops. He didn't sell things. He just went there to sort of buy things. It was like this little sort of treasure trove that he would sort of search through all the time, okay? And so uh, he um, was all about that. And so I've never been in a pawn shop, but I have watched TV shows about pawn shops. Have you seen these shows, Right? And here's what happens all the time. People come in and they're like, man, I got this, this, this antique and it's been in our family for generations. Uh, it means the world to me. Like it's been, it was like my great, great grandfather passed it on to his son and his son and all this. And so now I have it and I'm here today to just kind of see what, I don't know if I'm going to be able to part with it, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, see, see what you would be willing to give me for it. And the guy's like, ah, I'll give you 40 bucks. And he's like, sold, done, done, let's do it. All of a sudden, it reveals the true value that this little thing had in their life, right? See, what you're willing to part with, it shows, it reveals the true value. You can say all these things. You can tell the story. You can have all these things. But once that money is offered, what you're willing to part with it for shows 
the value. That reveals the true value. I would say for us, similarly, the real value that we hold up for the kingdom of God is revealed in the way that we live out our life. You see, we are willing to sacrifice for things of value. And I think there's different ways that we value them. I think some things have perceived value, right? Like we, we, we kind of assign value to it or we perceive that this thing is valuable and so therefore we're going to invest in it and uh, you know, give, give time, give energy, give attention to it, sort of this perceived value. I think some things in our life have delayed value, right? Like that's where retirement counts or... or um, savings accounts or uh, any sort of kind of, you know, putting aside for the future. There's delayed value in that. I'm going to give up now so that there's something later on. Uh, We're willing to sacrifice for things of sentimental value. Uh, Maybe it's not worth, it's not the dollar amount that it's worth, but it is. It's got some sentimental value. This belonged to my mom. This belonged to my dad. This was given to me by my friend. This came from this special place that we had this, this thing. You know, whatever it might be, there's sentimental value. Sometimes we place social value on things because, uh, you know, uh, those around us or sort of our society would say, hey, this is a valuable thing. And so we we kind of like do that just because everyone else seems to think that it's valuable. So I'm going to as well. I can point to no better illustration than if you remember like pogs. Anybody? Anybody like was, yeah, ever have pogs or even like Pokemon cards, baseball cards? Like I still have like bins of baseball cards they are now just like taking up space and I have no idea, I can't bring myself to get rid of them. So that person that kind of hangs on to stuff, Bree was thinking for sure, she knows it's me, okay? I'm the one who hangs on to stuff. I have like bins of baseball cards. And at the time, they had a lot of sort of social value. We said that they were valuable. Now it is pretty hard to sell baseball cards the way that we uh, did when I was a kid, man. I loved, loved having that baseball card. I'd get that, that, that pack of cards. I'd rip it open. I'd start chewing on that gum, and I would, you know, look through and see who I got. and who I did, You know, I, I love that. But that's like kind of the social value. It kind of comes and goes, that sort of thing. But then you have actual value. What is it really worth? What does it really value? How long is it going to last? What Jesus is saying here is that the kingdom of heaven is like this treasure, is like this fine pearl. This thing has an actual value. God's reigning rule in our world, in our hearts, in our lives, it has the greatest value. And not just some perceived, not just some delayed, not just some sentimental, not just some um, kind of, uh, you know, Value that, that is, is temporary. This is actual, real value. It's eternal value. Eternal. It's uncorruptible. It's never going away. It's never going to fade. It's never going to be taken away. And the question that we are being asked by Jesus through this story is this. What value do you place on the kingdom of God? I think it goes further. How is that evidenced in the living out of your life? Not just the things that you say, not just the things that you once believed or would profess if you were asked the question, but if you were to look at the hours of your life, the days of your week, the places you spend your time, the places you spend your money, if you were to look at the things of your life, where are you putting your value? See, the way you live your life reveals the way, the amount you value the kingdom of God. And so when we make choices to uh, fill up that work schedule and it crowds out time for the community of the church, which God would say is of great value, being a part and in and part of a body of God, when we, when we fill our days, when we fill our times, and we have no time outside of maybe this gathering on Sunday morning for the community of God, what does that say about our value of the kingdom of God? Uh, you might be in a season of life that would uh, take you out of any opportunity and ability to be able to serve. And so you're just kind of like, well, right now I'm just, I'm, I'm going to put my gifts, I'm going to put my time, I'm going to put all this on hold. And, and, and it's just, I need to do this right now. What would that say about the value that Jesus would say toward the kingdom of God and what he's calling us to do? Maybe you're single and you've been tempted to make a compromise to, uh, date someone who doesn't share that same value of Christ. 
And instead of living out a full life now as a single and using all of the ways that God has wired and he's gifted you, you're tempted to make a compromise and to give in and to begin dating or maybe even pursue marriage with someone who's heading in a completely different direction. What does that say about the value of the kingdom of God in your life? Or maybe for you it's your hobbies or the things that you find entertaining. Is this robbing you of valuable time with your family? or valuable time with your friends, or valuable time with those who live around you in your neighborhood. I think about this all the time, is what is gonna be said of us when these days are over? I mean, I am realizing just how quick, uh, as for those of you who are parents, just how quick these years go, right? What's the saying? The days are long, but the years are short. Like we say all the time, we're like, how many more years do we have with our kids to be able to invest and be a part of this day? What does it say about what I value and the way that I am living out these things that God has called me to do and to model and to disciple in the lives of my children? What am I putting in value there? You see, the kingdom of God will not just take your life and make you a little better person. It won't just change a couple of things. The kingdom of God will completely transform everything about you. That is what this parable is driving for. The kingdom of heaven, like a treasure hidden in a field, a man found, he covered it up in his joy. He goes, he sells everything, all that he had. He gave it all up for what? For that treasure. This is the kingdom of God to us. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3.8. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Listen, if I could just kind of wrap it up and sort of land us here, what I would say to this is, is this. This is, this is not in any way meant to be uh, something that we walk out of and we feel guilty because we're not just, like showing enough value. Uh, rather, the contrary, what I would say, this is a good litmus test for what is that value. I would say it's not a matter of going out and changing how you live to show value. I would say it's understanding the value of God and his kingdom and his working in your life, once you understand that, then that will shift and that will change the way that you live. I think we have so many examples throughout scripture of men, of women who understood the value of the kingdom of God and their life reflected it. That would be my hope, my prayer for us as a church, for you as an individual, for you as a dad, for you as a mom, for you and your family, in your school, in your workplace, wherever the context of your life is, that you would be living out the value of the kingdom of God in clear display so that there'd be no question, no mistake of what value you place on God and his kingdom. Jim Elliott is an amazing missionary. We love telling the story. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard, you know the story of Jim Elliott. He and four of his friends, they went to minister in Ecuador to the Wadoni tribe. And they had been praying and working toward this for a long time. And, and um, to tell the story quickly, they were attacked by the tribe when they arrived. They had protection, they had guns, they consciously chose not to do it. They made the decision that why would we take the life of someone who doesn't know Christ when we know full well who Jesus Christ is and what he's done in our life. And so they gave up their life in effort to tell these strangers living far away from where they were about the kingdom of God. They had great value in Jesus Christ and who he was and famously, Jim Elliot was quoted for saying this, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Listen, church, this is what we are being invited to by Jesus Christ through this story. We are being invited to give up all of the things that fill our attention, that fill our time, that are so temporary and so fleeting and so distracting and so unsatisfying but yet they command how much of our attention and time. 
We are being invited by Jesus Christ this morning to give that up and to the, the, those things which we cannot keep in effort to gain from him that which we can never lose. There is an eternal promise that awaits us, an eternal glory, an eternal relationship with our heavenly father, and it is of the greatest, greatest value. And so I would say this, during this time, as we continue to live this out in this life and the kind of season we're in now, as we put our eyes on God, I would say this, is that God is a God that we can live for. He's a God that we can sacrifice much for. He is a God that is worthy of all of our affection and all of our time and all of our attention. And when we get that priority set, when we get that understanding, then all of it makes sense. I love, again, for the final time, let me go back and say what he said. It says, then in his joy, he went and he sold all that he had to buy that, food, that field. Let's in our joy pursue after Jesus, knowing that he is of the greatest value and he is worthy of it all. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you again for your invitation which you have given to us. God, that's an invitation that is extended to each and every person here today. Lord, many of us have received that invitation, but will we invite and be invited back into it again afresh right now? Or do we understand, would we know, would we be reminded of the value of what it is that you've invited us to. God, this life in you, this redeemed life in your son, Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for anyone who is searching, who their soul is longing, who they're, they're, they're trying, they're looking for the place of satisfaction, God, that place of value. I pray that as they turn toward you, God, even this morning, that they would embrace and receive if there's anyone here who has never done that, that they would receive you as their savior in this place, even as they hear my words being spoken and that they would know you, that they would know the value of who you are and what you've done. Jesus, thank you for your gift of salvation. God, thank you for inviting us into this. Lord, would we live for you knowing that it's worth it. God, it's worth it. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.